uh, said the other day, you know, it's a day of worship. It's a day of rest. I want to try to do both of them. Don't you? you? Do. I love to worship. I'm glad we get to worship. But I like that rest day and that time of uh, sort of relaxing its way. Good to see you tonight, Sunday night service, and see this number out on Sunday night. Ah, that's good. That's a blessing. We're glad you're here. And uh, I hope that the Lord just blesses us. Now, this past Wednesday night, we started kind of maybe a little more of a teaching type ministry than it is a teaching type ministry. And I think when God calls us to preach, it's not only to be a preacher, but a teacher as well. And, of course, it's hard for me to teach when I'm a preacher, but uh, I, I try to do it a little every now and then. And we started Wednesday, we, we were talking about the church. And on Wednesday night, we talked a lot about the foundation of the church. When did the church actually begin? And that when we talked about that and said, you know, that's kind of a hard uh, one to really fit in. And uh, we went back and made mention that the good uh, rule of thumb is when is it first mentioned. And, of course, Jesus mentioned it a couple of times there in Scripture. He told uh, Peter, said, Peter, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That was one of the first mentions of the church. But I think he was talking about the church future, not the church right then. I don't think it had actually... Uh, begun yet, and we also made mention that the church was not in the Old Testament, Now it was an assembly, it was a congregation, but it was not addressed or identified as a church. And finally, we've pretty much come to the conclusion that the church, that we know, we're not talking there about the local church, but we're talking about the church, the body of Christ, the, the, the believers, it's made up of everybody, doesn't matter what denomination you might be or what title you may hold. If you've been born again, saved with the grace of God, you're of the church. And that's the church that we were talking about. Now tonight, we'll probably pursue just a little bit of the local church and the purpose of the ch uh, church and the purpose of the local church. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 28. And verse number 19. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. You find your place, if you would, let's stand. We'll reverence together the reading of these two verses. Together. Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Purpose of the church. Father, help us tonight. Direct our thoughts and what we have to say, Lord, may it be through the leadership and direction of the sweet Holy Spirit. And Lord, would you speak to this congregation tonight what we stand in need of, would you challenge our hearts that uh, we as a church and as a local church that we may might be more effective in carrying out this commission that not only you left to the disciples of that day, but you left to the disciples of all ages. And Lord, may we fulfill this commission that you have given unto us. May we, Lord, reach out to the lost and the dying, the perishing. And Lord, tell them about Jesus Christ and invite them to come and know this man called Jesus in their life. Help us to be a better witness. Help us to be a bolder witness. And help us, Lord, to share this good news of Jesus Christ to our friends, to our neighbors, to those that we come in contact with. Lord, would you help us and use us for your glory in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Jesus left his disciples with these last words of instruction. Usually, uh, we call it uh, uh, today the last will and testament, the very last things that are being said. And most times, uh, if not all the time, there are very, very important statements. 
Here is the last earthly statement that Jesus made to the disciples and to the followers of Christ. And the statement that he made was to go and teach all nations in the name of the Father, and it mentions the Trinity here. The word Trinity is never mentioned in the Bible. Do you know that? The Trinity is never mentioned. But the triune God, the Trinity of God is mentioned so many times. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Now, they are one. That's the three in one. You have God the Father, you've got God the Son, and you've got the God the Holy Spirit. They're all God. They make up the great Godhead. They were to make more disciples. God help us that we'll make more disciples. That's right. And you pray to that end tonight. God help me that I might be a faithful witness to make more disciples. Then they were to baptize and teach them to obey him. And he would be with them always. Boy, they had not had a, a blessing there to know that the Lord's going to be with us. He will guide us. He'll direct us. He's not going to send us into a mission work and go with us. So he said, I'll be with you all the way. Bottom line, we're to go. Whether it's next door or across, uh, to another country, we are to go and make disciples. By the way, it's not an option. If you take this verse as what Jesus is saying, it's not an option. It is a command to all of those who call Jesus the Lord and say, it is a command for us to be a witness. Baptism then unites a believer with Jesus Christ, his death to sin, and his resurrection in your life. And that's what happened the day that we were baptized. We were signifying to the world that we had died out to the old life and the life of sin, and we were resurrecting to walk in the newness of life. Baptism also shows submission to Christ. We're submitting ourselves unto the Lord. Now, the purpose of the local church has already been given to us by our Lord. This mission, the purpose, the vision are all part of what we know as the Great Commission. Two years ago, this uh, June, uh, Deb called me. I was away from home one evening. She said, Dr. Bruce Barnes called you and wants you to call him. And so I called Dr. Barnes, and he answered the phone, and he said, Brother Eddie said, we'd like for you to preach at the state meeting this year. And I said, I am honored that you would ask me. And uh, I went quite nervous preaching in front of a bunch of other preachers and ones that were are uh, far more educated and and smarter than the word that I, but my subject that I was given was on the Great Commission. And I was to preach about that thought. And they give me a few little starter points and I was to kind of stay within that framework and then they said the rest of it's up to you. You fill in the rest of it as the Lord leads you. And we preached about the Great Commission. There are three components in this commission. This is not what I talked about there. Uh, the message that I preached there, I remember some of it. Some of the folks at the church at Macedonia where we're at didn't get to go to the state meeting. They didn't hear it. They said, why don't you give us what you gave them? So I did preach it to them. I guess it was the only other time I preached it. But let me give you the three components of, of this commission that you and I have. First, we are to pursue lost people. We are to pursue lost people. America was largely a church culture back in the 1950s. The war was over. People were anxious to resume their lives. Involvement in a local church was part of that process. Churches just put out a sign out front, visitors welcome, and wouldn't it be wonderful if that happened today? Amen. But it just don't happen a lot of times. We've continued the belief that lost people should come to church. Let me 
me ask you a question right here. How many of you believe lost people will come to church? <laughs> I certainly do. One of the best places in the world for a lost person to get saved is in the church house. And lost people ought to come to church. But really, you'll have a difficult time finding that in the Bible. The teaching of the Bible is that Christians must go after the lost people. No words does it say they are compelled to come to church, but it says we are compelled to the highways and the hedges and get them and bring them to church. Amen. The old saying that we hear a lot of times of beating the bushes. We need to do a little more bush beating, don't we? Yeah. There's a lot of lost people in our, my family and your family in this neighborhood that need Jesus Christ. God could send angels to get the job done. I'm sure he could because look at all the instances in the Bible and the Old Testament that God sent an angel to bring messages to people. But God's not chosen to go that route in the church age. The way he has chosen to get the gospel message out for lost in the dying world is through people like you and me. Amen. And you say, what if we fail? Does God have an alternate plan? No, he doesn't. This plan will work if you and I do what God wants for us to do. Amen. Now, the illustration, and it's illustrated throughout the book of the Bible, in the book of Luke, in Luke chapter 5, verse 27 through 32, Levi has received Christ into his life. He in turn invites his lost friends to a banquet for the purpose of introducing them to Christ. You know what had happened in Levi's life? He met Jesus. There was a change brought about in his life. And it was so dramatic and it was so great that he wanted others to have what he got. Shouldn't we be like that? Yeah, amen. Shouldn't we have something that we want others to have what we've got? Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, if you don't believe in the product, you're going to have a hard time selling it. If I was trying to sell vacuum cleaners and I didn't believe in the vacuum cleaner that I was trying to sell, I'd have a hard time selling it. If I was selling cars and I didn't believe in that make a car as being a good car, I'd have a hard time selling it. If I don't believe Jesus is the best thing that can happen to people, I'm going to have a hard time selling people on it. Yeah. The best thing that ever happened in my life and if you're saved, he's the best thing that ever happened in your life. Amen. And if you've got something that's that good, don't you want to try and share that with somebody else? Someone said one time, salvation or winning loss to Christ is like one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. You remember those four old lepers in the Bible? were put outside the city and they were going over to the enemy cave and the, they said if we go over there they're probably going to kill us but if we sit here we're going to starve to death anyway there was a famine inside the city and people were on the verge of starvation and the enemy had heard the noise uh, from God during the night they had fled and they got over there and the enemy came there wasn't anybody there there was all the spoils and all the food. And here were their own people back over uh, inside the city dying from starvation. And as they began to eat and they began to gather the spoils, one of them said to another and said, We do not well. Our brethren are over there starving to death. Let's go tell them where we found bread. They went and told them. And they came out and gathered the spoils and the food and it sustained them through the famine that was in the land. Folks, that's the way we ought to be. We have met the greatest person of all ages. 
We have come in contact with someone that everybody else needs to know about. Would you agree with that? Amen. Then the second reference is in Luke 15. In this passage, Je Jesus illustrates the pursuit of lost things. You remember this is the lost and found chapter in the Bible. There was the lost coin that the woman took a candle and searched diligently to which she found it. There's the story about the lost sheep, the one that went astray. And the shepherd left the 99 to go after the one lost sheep. Then there's the prodigal son that went astray and came back home. It's <laughs> illustrating to us that as the coin and the sheep, we need to go and get. And the third reference is in Luke 19. The Bible said the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. <laughs> now, if we didn't have any lost people to pursue, I'd say just come to church and let's sit here and do nothing but worship. It didn't nothing take you know, anybody with a very good high education. No, there's a lot of lost people. There's more lost people than there are saved people. In fact, when it comes to the end of the world, there's going to be more people die and go to hell than there are dying and go to heaven. You say, how do you know that? Are you a prophet? No, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Yeah. Straight and narrow is, is the gate of the road that leadeth into heaven, and few there be that find it. Broad is the road that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that fall in or go in thereat. So folks are going to be more lost than there are saved. We must realize that America has become predominantly unchurched. Amen. In the 50s, church attendance was expected even if the person was unsaved. People were expected to go to church, but that's simply not the case today. It's hard to get lost people to come to church. I don't, I'll admit that. I know it. But it's not impossible. So let's treat, keep trying to reach them. Uh, unchurched America simply does not believe that the church is relevant to their needs that they have in their life. We often speak an entirely different language. We speak a different language from those that are lost, folks that are in the church. Let me give you an example. There's an evangelist who went to a community, a community in the area, and the evangelist asked the store clerk, said, are you a member of the Christian family? And the store clerk said, no, they live two miles down the road, White House on the left. <laughs> And the evangelist said, let me try again. He said, are you lost? And the store clerk said, no, I've lived in this town for over 30 years now, and I know right where I'm at. And the evangelist said, let me put it this way. Are you ready for the judgment day? And the store clerk said, when will it be? And the evangelist said, it could be today, and it could be tomorrow. And the store clerk said, well, when you know exactly, be sure to let me know. My wife will probably want to go both days. <laughs> so the language between the church and the lost a lot of times is an altogether different language. Second, look at the evangelism of lost people. The last several years have not been especially fruitful for evangelism. The number of adults who have accepted Christ as their personal Savior hasn't increased, it's decreased. Mm -hmm. People just not interested. They don't care. They're not concerned. But then I wonder if some of it rests upon our shoulders of not getting the message out to them. We're not reaching unsaved people. We're simply a lot of times moving saved people from one church to another. Large churches generally getting larger at the expense of the smaller church. And a lot of times when one church says we're growing, they're growing a lot of times at the expense of other churches. I'm not one for proselyte. I believe we ought to reach out to lost people and the Bible didn't say grow the church and the church will grow daily such as should come from others to be part of yours. It said it will grow daily by what? Such as shall be saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. Several characteristics distinguish Great Commission churches.
in the area of evangelism. Let me give you some styles of evangelism. We often think that evangelism can be done only one way. There are actually six and maybe more, but I know there's at least six different evangelistic styles in the New Testament. There's confrontational style. It's used by Peter in Acts chapter number two. Do you remember when he stood and preached the great sermon there uh, at Pentecost and he preached repent and be baptized for the remission of sins? 3,000 were saved and added to the church. But there aren't really many people who can take the Bible, walk up to a person and seek to win that person to Christ. In fact, statistics say that less than 14% of church people have the gift of evangelism. That's sad, really. You may not know a lot of Bible. You need to know as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Want to be growing daily in the nurture and the admonition. One thing that we ought to know, everyone else, is the proper way to try and lead somebody to Christ. And we call it a lot of times the Romans' road to salvation. You know what the Romans' road to salvation is? Romans 3, 23, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. When I talk with somebody around the altar somewhere about being saved, I say, do you know what that means? It means that you're lost, but it also means that I was lost. And I need a Savior, and you need a Savior. For all sin and come short of the glory of God. Remind them of Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I remind folks there's going to be a payday one day. At the end of this journey, at the end of life, there's going to be a payday. Now, it can be a good one or it can be a bad one, but it's up to you to decide which one you want. Then I remind them of Romans 5, 8. It says, but God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. While I was no good for nothing, hell deserved and sinner, Christ hung on that cross and paid my sin day. And I remind them of that. Hey, Christ died for you. I don't know your situation. I don't know where you're at in life, but Christ died that you could have life. Yeah. Amen. Then Romans 10, verse 9, said if we would believe in our heart that God had raised Jesus Christ from the dead, we can be saved. Amen. The Bible says, For with the heart man believeth in the righteous, with mouth con uh, confession is made unto salvation. Then I take them down to verse number 13. I said, Look, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I remind lost people of this. Hey, I've got a bunch of Bibles. I don't have any I've got. <coughs> but outside of one, the new one, and I, be honest, I haven't probably taken it out of the box for a time or two. I've looked through some of it. But I've got a lot of Bibles. Some of them I wore out. Some of them, Genesis is in Revelation. <laughs> and that's all right. What good are they if you ain't going to use them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you ought to wear them out. And uh, those fellows said one time, if there's more dust on the Bible than there is on the car, you're in trouble. Well, I was washed and waxed my truck yes, and I thought about that 500 times. <laughs> and like the, the, the Lord just kept reminding me. And so I got done, I went in, I spent the next hour in the book. I said, well, we'll put some time out there and he put some time in here. There's got to be a good balance in that. So I did that. Now I'm lost my truck. Boy, don't ever jump the rabbits and start chasing them, because when you do, you're headed for trouble. Uh, let me get back on track here. I don't usually do that. Uh, lose just exactly where I was at. I'll go back and look at some notes and go from there. Oh, we're talking about winning people to Christ by taking them through the gospel and, and, and allowing them to see their need of Christ. Folks, take those verses that I shared with you. Take the Romans road. And the next time you get an opportunity to share with somebody those, uh, those verses and help to try and lead them to Christ, then there's the intellectual style that's used by Paul in Acts 17, which involved reasoning with Jesus and God-fearing Greeks from the Scripture. That he had 
explain and he proved that Christ had to suffer in the seemed to be the style he used when he stood before his presentation there. Folks, that's just simply, hey, the message is Jesus Christ. <laughs> that's good news. That's the gospel. The gospel is good news. That's telling lost people Jesus was born, he lived a sinless life, died, was buried, and he rose again. And that's the message. Then there's testimonial style demonstrated in John 9 where Jesus healed the man that was blind from birth. And they came to the blind man and they didn't like the fact that he was giving credit to the fact that Jesus had healed him of his eyesight. And he told him, he said, well, the man called named Jesus. He come by here. He made a clay spittle. He put it upon my eyes, told me to grow royce in the full of slow. And I went and washed and, and came back. Seeing, I received my sight. And they said, this man's a sinner. Said, you need to give God praise, but this man's a sinner. And he said this, whether he be a sinner or not, I do not know, but this one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. That's the testimonial style. This style was also used by Paul before Agrippa. He simply was telling Agrippa what the Lord had done in his life. Amen. You don't have to be a theologian to do that. Amen. Just tell people what Jesus has done for you. Then there's relational style. Mark 5, here Jesus cast a demon out of a man who then desires to be with the Savior. And instead Jesus tells him, said, go home to your family and friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Through your changed life, let people know that you're a Christian. Don't be ashamed of that. Mm -hmm. Whether it's work, whether, well, I don't think anybody in here is in school, but whether it be at work, at school, in your neighborhood, Wherever you at, don't be ashamed that you're a Christian. There's the, then there's the invitational style. It's illustrated in John 4 by the conversion of the Samaritan woman. She trusted in the Savior. She went back to her people and she invited them to come hear Jesus. Do you invite anybody to church this week? I know that we're living in a time right now pandemic that's in our land and and all of that. I understand that. We still would be inviting people to Christ. Amen. I'm the church. Best place to give them. Then there's a the service style. Dorcas models this style of evangelism in Acts 9 through her acts of, of kindness. Henry Ford. Everybody knows about Henry Ford, don't you? He purchased a large insurance policy in the Detroit newspapers blazing the fact since the amount was so large and he was such a prominent man. The story was read by one of Ford's friends who happened to be in the insurance business. The old friend went to confront Ford to see if the story was true and Ford assured him that it was. The friend asked him why the policy wasn't purchased from him since he was a personal friend and had been in the insurance uh, business for so many years. And Ford's reply was this, you never asked me. <laughs> How many of our friends can say to us, you never asked me as to our sharing Christ? Sad thing to see people die and leave this world and go to whatever state. But it's a tragic thing when we have friends, neighbors that are unsaved, that have never seen anything to them about Jesus Christ. What about one day when we stand there and they look at us and say, Well, I can't tell you about Jesus. Amen. second characteristic of Great Commission churches is motive. The motive for evangelism in a lot of churches is simply guilt. They go out of a guilt complex. But the first thing that ought to motivate us is gratitude that flows from our love for Christ. We ought to do it 
the cause for the great and for what he's done for us. Amen. Then secondly, the second motive is loving obedience. We'll obey what he's told us to do. We read these passages in like places like Matthew 28, and we say, well, he's, he's talking to all them that were right there in his presence at that time. He's speaking to disciples all down through. Go and we both go and evangelize. Go and tell people about Jesus and win them to Christ and disciple them, bringing them to the Lord. Then a third characteristic of Great Commission churches is the message. The average church member feels that evangelism is the sole responsibility of the pastor and the preacher. And they, that's why we pay. <laughs> You'll not find that philosophy in the New Testament either. Right. The apostles whom we identify as the preachers were in Jerusalem. There was persecution that came. Christianity began to spread throughout the known world. You know, it's sad that people are persecuted. But God used persecution at the beginning of the early church to spread the gospel to more areas. Because they were persecuted, they began to spread out. More people got to hear about Jesus Christ, and because of that, more people got saved. You say, who were the main spreaders of Christianity? Was it the preachers? No. In Acts 8, 1, it tells us that it was the lay people. In fact, listen to the way the scripture is, is, is written there in Acts chapter 8. And verse number one, it says Saul was consenting unto his death. He's talking about Stephen. And at that time, there was great a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. They were. So by the others being spread, it had to be the others that were taking the gospel message to the lost world, and they were evangelizing and Seeing people saved. Let me give you the last thing. The edification of saved people. The ultimate goal of the Great Commission is not just to reach people with the gospel. The ultimate goal is to disciple people. You reach them. You bring them to Christ. Then you disciple them in the Lord. It's to reach people and equip them in such a way so that they in turn reach other people. Boy, if, if we if it just if we just do that, think of how the church, the local church, even could grow by leaps and bounds. We're we're discipled. We we invite others to Christ. We disciple them, and in the process, they win somebody else, and those who are one are discipled. They win somebody else, and they're discipled, and it just is a continuous process. Amen. Seeing a church grow, seeing more people saved and come to know the Lord. Well, that's that. I like that part, don't you? Amen. Amen. There are three very important elements in this edification process, and we'll be done. They teach new believers. You know, the Bible makes it clear that when a person gets saved, they're spiritual babies. Mm -hmm. Not mature in the things of the Lord. There's, there's. They're just as ignorant towards Scripture as they possibly can be. That you can't expect a new convert to know very much about the Scripture. And that's why they're considered to be babes in Christ. And we're to nurture them and bring them along. Just you begin feeding a physical baby milk, then you progress to more satisfying food. So a new Christian begins with the milk of the Word of God. And I think a good place to begin on milk is in the book of John. Don't start them in the book of Revelation. Right. Don't stick them back there and say, here, read that. They'll read that because the only way you're going to understand anything about Revelation is to know a whole lot about the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Because Revelation makes no sense to anybody if you don't know a lot about the prophecies that were given in the Old Testament. Then when you take those Old Testament prophecies 
and bring them over into the book of Revelation, you can begin to understand what John was seeing while he was on the island of Patmos. And by the way, that wasn't the revelation of John the, ba uh, or John the Divine. Did I say John the Baptist the first time? Wasn't John the Baptist, John the Divine? That wasn't the revelation of John the Divine. Now, you'll actually get some Bibles that will say that. But you know what that revelation was? It says it in the very first verse. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's what Christ gave to John on the island of Patmos. Do you understand everything that's in the book of Revelation? Uh-uh. And I got news for you. There's a lot of other people that don't need And some of the things that John wrote down that Jesus revealed to him while on the island of Patmos, John put it in words that, the, that he could best describe what he was witnessing and seeing while he was there on the island. And, and John knew exactly what he was saying that may seem a little foreign to you and I. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, listen. I'm not telling you the book of Revelation cannot be understood. It can be. Take some in-depth study. And a new, new Christian in Christ doesn't need to be in there trying to dig out things to help them to grow. The book of John is a good place to begin. <clears throat> Hebrews 5, 12 through 14 talks about not staying a baby forever. It's all right to be a baby in Christ. But don't stay there. Some need to Grow up past where you're at right now. The book of Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 said, For when the time you ought to be teachers, you ought to mature to the point you ought to be teaching others. Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Then we're to encourage new Christians to felt Christians to fellowship with other more seasoned Christians who are following Christ. That's what happened in the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 20, uh, 42. Acts 2 and verse 42, it says this. In fact, let me read verse uh, 41 before I read that. I made reference to this a minute ago. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same uh, there were added to them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the word of And they continued steadfastly in the apostle doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. There's an ever-increasing need for people who can model effective Christianity so new converts can follow after that mold they're seeing in seasoned Christians. God help us to be that. Then we're to lead new converts to worship God. Worship, and especially music in worship, involves people in knowing God not only with their minds, but with their hearts. I appreciate the music you have here at Admiral Crew Baptist Church. Man, I, I was telling Deb this afternoon, I said, uh, you know, it, it just, I don't know about you, but it just seems like we've got a new zeal and, 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 and a desire just to want to be in church and be with God's people. And I said, I just enjoy the music at Admiral Church. And I do. I want you to know that. And all you that take part in it, and boy, it, it helps to, to grow people. Uh, and, and it gets you ready uh, to preach the Word of God. And just look at Beth. She got up and sung that this morning and just wore me out when I got up here for it. <laughs> See, the power of God was already here. And I'm saying that in a good sense, Beth. Don't you take it the wrong sense. <laughs> the structure of the New Testament church was twofold. They met in public gatherings, and we're very comfortable with this type of meeting here in the house. But they met in small groups as well. I don't know how many of you are old enough and been a Christian long enough to remember those old cottage prayer meetings. Do you remember? Had them in houses. You went from had little small groups. Some of the greatest meetings that you ever been in your life was old cottage prayer meetings. 
prayer of God just failed and was real. Now, let me close, and I, I'm done for you, with you tonight. And we can go home, and now I can get some rings. <laughs> the success of the New Testament church, get this, we don't get anything else, is directly contributed to the dedication and commitment of the people within that congregation. If you're not committed, it will not succeed. But when you can become committed in the things of the Lord and the work of the Lord, I believe the church and the local church can prosper for the glory of God. Yeah. I want to be a part of that, don't you? Mm -hmm. Amen. And I want to tell you this. I'm going to ask God, and I hope we're, we're just going to stand tonight here in just a minute. And I want you to ask God to help you be a more effective witness. I'm going to ask you to ask God to help you to be a bolder witness. How many of us need boldness? <clears throat> How many times have you ever been in the presence of someone and walked away and you said, oh, I wish I could say something about Jesus. How many times we have no trouble talking about the weather? We have no trouble talking about fishing. We have no trouble talking about hunting. We have no trouble talking about sports. We have no trouble talking about umpteen other things. Amen. But when it comes to talking about Jesus, we just clam up and find it hard to say anything. I found this to be true. Not every time has the opportunity to present it itself to tell somebody about Jesus. But I've been in this long enough, and many of you have too. We can sense the moments that the Holy Spirit is directing us <coughs> to say something about Him. And boy, when He's directing you, take full advantage of it. Because while God's working in your heart, I'll assure you, God's working on the other side in the other heart. See, lots of times, he's already been there before you got there. Mm -hmm. So what we're so afraid of is not all that fearful after all. It's called, see, he promised I'll never leave. If I send you to do something, I'll go with you. Amen. And if I've told you in the Great Commission to teach them and to win them to Christ and see them baptized and added to the church and disciple them and help them to grow in the Lord. If I've instructed you to do that, I'm not going to give you a task to do that I won't go with you and help you to accomplish. God calls you to teach, he'll equip you to be a teacher. If God calls you to preach, he'll equip you to be a preacher. God, whatever office or position God calls you to do, God will equip you to do that. Now, this here is not something that we can or cannot do. This is a direct command, so it's not an option. Amen. So if he's commanded us to go, he said, I'll go with you. Do you believe it? Let's stand and ask God to help all of us. Father, we know so often that opportunity presents itself. And if we're not real careful, we shy away from that. When people need to be confronted and talked to and invited to come to know Jesus Christ, so often the easiest thing to do is just push that wooing of the Holy Spirit off to the side and go on. And we can blame it on not knowing what to say. We can blame it on a lack of boldness. We can blame it on a number of things. But Lord, you said if we do it, if you give us permission to do it, you'd go with us and you'd never leave us alone. So Lord, I pray this evening, help me to be a better witness. Help me to let my life so shine that others might be able to see Christ in me. 
And help me each day that I'll not do anything to bring a reproach to the sweet name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, when opportunity does present itself, help me, Lord, to share this good news and this gospel of Jesus Christ with my friends, with my neighbors, with those that we come in contact with on a daily basis. Help me to have enough love in my heart to reach out to them with Jesus Christ. Help us all. Help us as a local church to fulfill your great commission. In Jesus' name. And amen. amen. All right. God bless you. I hope you've had a good evening this evening. I know it's been a good day. I thank you. Amen. In church. Had a tremendous time this morning. And uh, I think God's met with us again tonight. A lot of times I like to sleep church being challenged to do something more. Sometimes I just need to be reminded. Hey, I know it helps me to be reminded. And I hope we've been reminded tonight. May God help us to be better with us. Here. You ready to go? Folks, you are at liberty in the fear of the Lord. God bless.